So, the Russian Civil War. This one is really complex. It's, uh, there are a lot more different sides fighting than in, say, the American Civil War. So we're going to have to spend like half of this lecture just detailing who is who. Um, starting out with the Reds, the Bolsheviks, and starting um, in the middle of 1918, the Communists, as they changed their name from the Bolshevik Party to the Communist one. Um, the Red Army was led by Leon Trotsky. He was um, not necessarily the great military strategist um, among the Bolsheviks, but he was an organizational genius. Um, lucky thing for the Bolsheviks, because he had not exactly been in this kind of situation before. Um, the Red Army was a combination of, um, of fighters from different sources. Obviously, the, the Red Guards, the old Bolshevik paramilitary organization, was the backbone um, of the Red Army. You, you had a lot of sailors from uh, this, this naval base called Kronstadt outside Petrograd. Um, and we're going to run into these guys again when they actually turn against the communists um, in a few years. But for right now, they are also part of the uh, square the backbone of the Red Army. There were a lot of soldiers left over from the old uh, Russian Imperial Army that had you know, been radicalized by their experiences uh, in that army, or who were just kind of, well, they realized that they needed to eat something, and the only way to eat something if you are a soldier is to fight for somebody. Um, and the Red Army could always keep its soldiers fed, so there was that. Um, also, obviously, uh, workers who were the, kind of a natural recruitment source for the Bolsheviks, um, and once they ran out, conscripts from, uh, from the peasants. Um, and the peasants weren't necessarily always happy to be fighting for the Reds. Um, I don't want to give you that idea. They were, uh, they, um, the peasants deserted from the Red Army at just as great a rate as they did from uh, the different white armies. Um, but at the same time, there were, there were a decent number of peasants in the Red Army. Next, the whites. Um, now, the whites are a mix, um, and that's, you know, one of the reasons that makes them difficult, but also interesting to study. And it's also one of the reasons that they ended up losing the war. Um, there was such a hodgepodge of, um, you know, liberals, old monarchists who wanted to restore the czar until he was assassinated. Um, the, uh, you had nationalists kind of fighting for their own uh, independent homelands. You had socialists who had been shut out by the Bolsheviks, um, prominently uh, 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 socialist revolutionaries in the, in the East. You had Don Cossacks, different uh, um, Don Cossacks in the um, in the uh, Ukraine region, you had separatists um, who you know, wanted to wanted to break away from Russia, um, and basically the only thing they had in common was anti-Bolshevism. Often they didn't even even have that in common; they just had opportunism in common. Um, you know, the, being part of the White Army was seen as a great way to, um, uh, to potentially um, you know raid the countryside um, and just be a you know marauding army stealing goods and um, essentially killing enemies. Um, and we're going to talk about four important, four main white armies, and there were more. Um, there was Udinich. We're going to go forward right now. So the first main army was uh, led by General Udinich, and that was up here in the area um, uh, coming from Estonia and attacking towards Petrograd. You also had the Southern Volunteer Army, which was based uh, mostly in the Ukraine around this area, um, and it was on and off allied with different uh, Cossack, uh, uh, Cossack regiments. Um, you had the Komuch, which is short for the Committee of whatever Uch stands for, I do not know, but it is made up of the a lot of the kind of moderate former members of the Constituent Assembly, um, and they made headquarters in Samara. However, they were a little bit too um, uh, moderate to, to really do much, and the, um, the, uh, the Bolsheviks handled them fairly, uh, fairly easily. But they did have enough serious um, politicians that they could legitimately claim to be the real government of Russia during this time period. Um, and also you had the Omsk government, Omsk out here on the uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad, which eventually came to, um, came to, came to rule uh, most of Siberia. You had a different group. You had the Greens, and uh, the Greens are mostly peasant armies. They're made up of deserters from, uh, from other armies. They're made up of people who never were in armies, who just want to kind of either protect or build a little local fiefdom, um, um, you know, in their, in their own neighborhood. Um, they were 
Um, a lot of the time, they were just kind of locally violent groups. And a uh, very famous Green, who is also, um, you know, he could be considered part of uh, uh, the Black Army, Black for anarchists, because he was an anarchist, was Nestor Machno, who was, uh, um, you know, a very interesting guy, got wonderful style, clearly. Um, and he was uh, a guerrilla fighter who would sometimes work for the whites, sometimes he would work for the reds. Really, I mean, he's an anarchist, so he believes in nothing, so that kind of makes sense. And um, here's where it starts to get increasingly weird. Um, you had the Czech Legion, which is just about my favorite of all of these different groups, and this is complicated, but they were they were um, some hardened soldiers who had been fighting for the Austro-Hungarian Empire during World War I, but they either deserted to join their fellow Slavs on the Russian side, or they were captured and taken prisoner. Um, they made a deal with the Tsarist government to fight against the, the Austro-Hungarians so uh, in order to create an independent Czech homeland um, in Bohemia, in, um, in Central Europe. Um, but the problem was, um, before, uh, before this could happen, you had the, uh, you had the, the twin revolutions of 1917. Um, and so the, the Czech Legion, which is kind of stranded out in Siberia, it made a deal with Lenin that um, Lenin would give them safe passage out of, out of Russia um, as long as the Czech Legion basically just stayed neutral towards the Bolsheviks. But things, things broke down the, um, as, the, as the Legion was making its way east on the Trans-Siberian. Some uh, local Bolsheviks tried to disarm the Legion. This led the, the, the Czechs to rise up against the Bolsheviks and decide that, well, if they were going to keep them from leaving Russia, then the Czechs were going to leave anyway, but they were going to go through Moscow and thus, you know, <laughs> destroying, overthrowing the Bolsheviks on their way. Um, so the, the, uh, the Czechs were able to basically take control of the entire Trans-Siberian Railroad, and for a while at least, they joined forces with the, um, with the White Army in Omsk. Okay, well, during this time period, Poland also, um, you know, it, it saw a weak Russia, a chance to, a chance to invade and recreate the old, um, the old, great uh, Polish Empire, and it did pretty well. It, um, it got as far as, it, as taking Kiev in the Ukraine, um, which was kind of tough on the people of that city. It changed hands 16 times during the Civil War, taken by you know, the Whites, the Bolsheviks, the Reds, the Poles. Um, and um, after Kiev, though, the, the Poles were pushed back, almost um, almost completely defeated. Um, but they made a stand at the gates of Warsaw, and um, this is a, it's very, you know, seen as very, very important, especially in Poland, as, you know, the time uh, that Poland saved Europe from uh, Bolshevik uh, communist revolution. Um, the, the Russians had kind of overextended themselves in their attempt to do just that, to, uh, to export revolution to, uh, to Poland and then on to Germany. Um, but in the end, uh, Poland kind of pushed uh, pushed the communists back um, at least halfway between uh, Kiev and Warsaw, and Poland got a, a good deal of territory back. Meanwhile, the Allies, um, uh, Britain, France, and the U.S., had uh, moved troops, uh, thousands of troops, into northern Russia, Murmansk and Arch Arkhangelsk, um, in order to open up a new front against the Germans. But then, once again, the um, um, the uh, second revolution happened, the, uh, the Bolsheviks got out of the war. So at that point, um, the Allies basically just started guarding um, the supplies and, and the territory there in the port just to, to keep it from falling into either German or communist hands. Um, and this wasn't the only, this wasn't the only goal. Staunch anti-Bolsheviks wanted uh, the Allies to actually truly intervene and try to tip the balance in the Russian Civil War, especially uh, young men like Winston Churchill, then British War Secretary. Um, but in the end, the, the Allies were kind of wiped out from, uh, from fighting World War I to begin with. And after um, the U.S. lost about uh, 300 soldiers um, and the other, uh, the other Allies lost uh, similar numbers. Um, but this was, this was not really seen as the Allies' fight. Um, so after a few years of doing relatively little fighting, just minor skirmishes, the Allies pulled out. Um, although there were also British and French um, invasions of the Caucasus and Ukraine, 
and a Japanese invasion of Siberia in order to, to grab some territory, which the U.S. then followed invading Siberia, mostly in order to stop Japan from annexing territory. Um, so you can pat yourself on the back if you're an American listening to this. You, your great-grandfathers did a pretty good job um, defending Russian territory. At one end, at the other end, they were kind of invading Russian territory. But yet it's complicated. It's the Russian Civil War. It's very, yeah, tricky stuff. So, advantages. Why did the Bolsheviks win? Um, they had a series of really, really important advantages. Um, most importantly, maybe, geography. Um, the Reds were centralized. They controlled the industrial heartland of Russia, <clears throat> meaning access to, um, to munitions, to supplies, um, and importantly, to the, uh, the heartland of the Russian population. So even if um, they had trouble, say, keeping their conscripts or their workers or their peasants in the army, in the Red Army, they just had access to a lot more of them than the Whites did. So the Reds had numerical advantages a lot of the time. Um, that, uh, that central location also gives you short, efficient internal uh, supply lines, which can have a way of kind of multiplying the forces available to you if you can send your forces to fight in Omsk and then you know, immediately send them by train to defend St. Petersburg you know, within a couple of weeks. That, uh, that gives you an effective fighting force of a lot more because there was no way that, say, the whites in Omsk could transport men to the whites outside Petrograd. That's just not going to work. Um, in fact, the whites, the whites were so separated and so riven by jealousies that a lot of the times the different white armies didn't coordinate at all, and the Bolsheviks were able to kind of pick them off piecemeal. Um, in terms of leadership, uh, Trotsky is given huge credit for, uh, for his work with the Red Army there, during this time period. Um, he, he did turn out to be a very impressive organizer and really brought back, uh, brought back um, great discipline, mainly through you know, the use of you know, execution, basically for any kind of hint of desertion, incompetence, um, that kind of thing. He, uh, Trotsky, Trotsky assigned political commissars who were fanatical Bolsheviks, uh, armed with machine guns, of course, um, to every, every uh, uh, small Russian unit. Um, with the orders that the, uh, the commissar, the political commissar, would stand behind the unit as it moved forward. And if any of the red soldiers tried to retreat or turn back, the commissar would just immediately machine gun them. Um, and that definitely has a way of, of kind of urging people forward. Trotsky, Trotsky famously talked, uh, explained that it, was, um, that it was basically, historically, had been the duty of army leaders to create a situation where behind one's troops, there was the absolute reality of death, but before them, there was only a possibility of death, so that the troops would move towards the possibility and away from the, um, the, the absolute, um, 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 absolute death at the hands of the commissars. Um, turned out to be pretty good advice on a practical level. Um, Trotsky himself, very brave. Um, he and his, uh, his band of, of men in, um, in his armored train would, uh, would go to the front wherever, um, wherever they were most needed with a, a train you know, bristling with guns and armor on the one hand and also filled with propagandists, with, uh, with equipment, with supplies, um, weapons. And so uh, Trotsky's appearance anywhere would, would instantly raise the morale and the fighting ability of uh, the Red Army in that area. This was, um, this was definitely kind of a contrast with the White Army officers who half the time, those in Omsk, for instance, were, were so corrupt and indifferent to their real duties that they, they spent their times in brothels, um, you know, in a haze of uh, alcohol and cocaine, really not doing very impressive fighting. Um, Trotsky, uh, another important thing Trotsky did was uh, building up the, um, the officer corps of the Red Army by allowing former czarist officers who were capable back into the mix. And, you know, obviously assigned, he assigned them commissars to make sure that they were, um, to make sure that they were not sabotaging the Red Army and that they were reliable. But um, Trotsky was uh, thought that competence was far more important than ideology. And finally, the, uh, the popular support that the Red Army um, had was ended up being greater than that of the White Army. 
Um, the, the Reds were able to present themselves as the only real patriots because they were expelling the, uh, you know, the, the evil foreign capitalists from northern Russia, from western Russia. Oh, I forgot to, admit, uh, to mention that the Germans had also invaded uh, southwest Russia again. Um, so there was that. Um, whereas the whites were, were um, allied in a lot of ways with the, uh, with the, uh, the U.S., Britain, and France. Um, the whites also were uh, kind of um, alienated the peasants and, uh, and workers by insisting that the gains of the revolution would be reversed once the, white, uh, once the whites took control of the country, which, you know, it's, it's hard, to, uh, hard to convince a peasant that you've conscripted or conscripted into your army to keep fighting for you if he knows that if he wins, all that will happen was you'll take his land away from you. Um, so that presented the whites another kind of self-inflicted problem. Um, finally, the whites um, refused to uh, grant their potential allies among ethnic minorities any kind of um, um, any kind of consolation prizes, independence, autonomy, that sort of thing. For instance, the Don Cossacks um, were willing to fight with the whites, but only to the extent that they were granted autonomy and independence in some kind of future state. But um, the, the Southern Volunteer Army would uh, refuse, to, refuse to promise them um, independence in the future. So the, the Cossacks, as often as not, would fight against the Whites as they would fight against the Reds. So those are major advantages of um, the, the Red Army. And there's, a, there's an economic and a political side, as well as a military side, to the Red victory during the Civil War. Um, during this during this time period, there was there was a really horrible level of of starvation, of deprivation, um, of economic ruin within the country. About if about nine million people total were killed in the Russian Civil War, um, only I believe about one million of them were killed in actual military combat, and upwards of five million people died in famines, died from starvation. A few million more died from the uh, the effects of um, of disease which was only um, kind of intensified by the, um, by the famine conditions throughout the country. Um, others died from, say, the Red Terror or other kind of random extra military killings. Um, the, what the Reds realized they had to do in order to win the Civil War was basically keep the army supplied and the workers fed. Um, and if if this meant that uh, conditions in the countryside would get even worse, well, that was, that was a sacrifice that the Bolsheviks were willing to make as long as they won the war. Um, so the series of policies known as war communism basically banned all kind of private trade and manufacture of, of goods, um, set up a dictatorship that would requisition, that would basically steal food from the peasantry and then redistribute it to the Red Army uh, and get it to um, the workers. There was rationing, and um, the most important people from the, the Bolshevik uh, viewpoint got the most food, whereas former bourgeois, for instance, um, they, were, they were down to uh, 50 grams of bread per day, which is really not so much to live on. A, a paperclip weighs one gram, so you get 50 grams of bread, or 50 paperclips of bread, that's eh, not so much to live on. Um, there was nationalization. If you remember, um, previously the, um, the Bolsheviks had given out, um, given to workers control of factories. That was reversed now because it turns out that the workers were, maybe they're good at working, but they were not, at least yet, capable of running factories. And so that was renationalized, recentralized. Um, and all in all, this, this created you know, great distress, great hardship among the population. There was um, you know, starvation in the cities, in the countryside. Um, the, the, the peasants resisted mightily um, these, uh, the requisitions of grains. Often the, the, Bolshevik, um, the, the Bolshevik agents who were sent to the countryside to get the grain ended up dead half the time, well, not half the time, but notoriously and famously with their, their stomachs cut open and then stuffed with grain. You know, kind of sends a message to the Bolsheviks, but one that the Bolsheviks were not necessarily willing to listen to. Um, and let's see, it did, however, the Bolsheviks, even despite the, the misery that war communism kind of uh, created, 
the Bolsheviks were willing to go along with it um, because not only did it um, kind of continue to undercut um, the uh, capitalist the capitalist economy, it also allowed them to um, to kind of take aim against internal enemies, people like the kulaks, if you remember, the um, uh, the kind of more wealthy farmers um, could be um, basically just hauled away and you know either shot or sent to a work camp, uh, basically arbitrarily. Um, now it's not to say that this the war communism was entirely um, successful at say um, by getting rid of private uh, private trade. There was a there was a huge black market that sprang up. Um, uh, made up of people trying to supply uh, grain to cities, um, goods to the peasantry. Um, but the, uh, the Bolsheviks fought against this tooth and nail. Um, at the same time, without that, there would have been even higher um, levels of starvation. So for the Bolsheviks, it was, it was necessary for the black market to exist, even if it was ideologically inconvenient or inconsistent. Now to enforce this, um, the, the Bolsheviks launched what was called the Red Terror. Um, if you remember the Cheka, which is the, um, the, the Bolshevik secret police um, had previously, uh, previously been formed. Um, and so after an assassination attempt on Lenin by, I believe, a, um, a disgruntled um, leftist uh, socialist revolutionary, um, the Cheka launched the Red Terror. Um, this you know, had, there were hundreds of thousands of victims of this, including at the top, um, the, the Tsar and his family who were executed in, um, in Ekaterinburg near the Urals when the, uh, when the Omsk government was closing in on them. Um, but again, this, this, uh, the Red Terror was, uh, was used against all types of uh, regime opponents, um, including you know, uh, even children. And finally, to, to close off the Civil War, um, Basically, the, the, the Bolsheviks, due to the lack of cooperation between the different armies, uh, the Bolsheviks were able to, um, to stop each of the different white armies um, by themselves. The Southern Volunteer Army um, was stopped, most importantly, at two different places. Um, one at Tsaritsyn, which, you know, flash forward 20 years, and this would be, will be probably the turning point of World War II, um, the same city. Um, and Stalin was... Uh, Stalin was um, more or less in charge of the Red Army uh, detachment that was that was guarding this. This was a very important city um, because if had the Southern Volunteer Army managed to take it, they would have been able to link up with the Komuch or the Omsk government and um, allow the um, the whites to to begin to cooperate a lot more. Um, but they were pushed back there. They were pushed back um, about two hundred miles outside of Moscow the next year, um, and. You know, one by one, the generals in charge of, of this army, Kornilov, then Denikin, then Wrangel, um, were either executed, like poor Kornilov, or um, escaped into exile. You had Udinich, who was um, also defeated outside Petrograd the next year. Um, and actually, Lenin wanted to abandon Petrograd, but Trotsky, uh, Trotsky refused, uh, got to Petrograd with his, uh, with his armored train, and successfully defended the city. Um, you had more confusing things happening in the Far East. The Czech Legion, which had been working together with Admiral Kolchak, which is kind of strange that a Russian admiral would be in charge of a bunch of Czech soldiers thousands of miles away from both Prague and any kind of navigable ocean. Um, this you know, it doesn't make sense, and it ended up not working out. The, uh, the, the Czech Legion got tired of Kolchak and handed him over to the Reds. Actually, they handed him over to some SRs, and the SRs handed him over to the Bolsheviks, who promptly shot him and tossed him in a frozen river. Um, but if nothing else, it got the Czechs out because they were able to continue along, um, and I think they exited Russia through Vladivostok and eventually worked their way back to, uh, back to Europe. Um, Machno, who's one of my favorite guys, um, you know, the anarchist going back and forth, fighting for the Reds, fighting for the Whites. Um, eventually he did help the Reds get rid of, um, the, the, the White Army in the Ukraine, but <clears throat> shocker, Machno, you really should have seen this coming. Then the Bolsheviks turned on Machno and, uh, arrested all of his supporters in the middle of the night. Machno tried to escape and actually succeeded. Um, 
Whether or not he got his wife with him, I'm not sure, which is important because Machno's wife was uh, notoriously uh, had executed um, you know, some, of his, uh, some of his main opponents after he had uh, captured them. Um, so don't mess with her either. It's a pretty tough family there. Um, and anyway, finally, by the end of 1922, the communists had basically defeated all their opponents, and the Civil War was over. Yay!